Please take a seat. All right. It's been a little while since I've seen some of you. So I have a question. In the last little while, what is something that God has done in your life that you are thankful for? And it is not a rhetorical question. I can wait. Yes, Chris. Uh, we made contact with my brother in Sydney and had a little family talk about on Zoom, and that was a great blessing. Communication with family is a lovely blessing. What else? Yes. Our daughter got accepted by the NDS, NDIS into supported and dependent living. So now she's in a house down at Kumara. That is a wonderful thing. My, uh, my sister a few years ago went through that same process, and I know it was a massive burden lifted off her parents. Anything else? Well, I'm grateful to see all of you here. I'm thankful for the blessing that we have in being God's children together, gathered together to worship him together. Sometimes you might be sitting there going, I actually haven't had a great week. I don't have anything to be thankful for. That's not entirely true. Sometimes life is hard and we're not promised in the Bible that life will be easy. What we are promised is that in Christ we have an assurity of life after death, that he is our saviour, and we can always be thankful for that. So with that in mind, would you join with me in this uh, prayer of thanksgiving that will appear now. Gracious God, we humbly thank you for life and health and safety, for freedom to work, leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. In a moment... Gwen's going to come up and we're going to open God's word together. But as she's doing that, let's pray that our hearts and our minds would be open, not just to hearing the word, but to being transformed by it. So, thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing the way of salvation through faith in your Son. We ask you now to teach and encourage us through your word so that we may be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Gwen. We are opening this morning with Psalm 143. 
Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. For the enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Therefore, my spirit faints within me and my heart within me is appalled. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder on the work of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Hide not your face from me, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord. I have fled to you for refuge. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. And in your steadfast love, you will cut off my enemies and you will destroy all the adversaries of my soul, for I am your servant. We now turn over to John 5, verses 16 to 30. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he give, gives him, give them life. So also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honour the Son just as they honour the Father. Whoever does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. Truly I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. The end of this lesson. It's the word of the Father. Thank you, Queen. Good morning, everybody. Um, if you see me waving at you, it's not you I'm really waving at. It's the people at the back because we can't find the clicker to change the, uh, the, the overheads. Let's just pray together. 
Lord, we pray with David, let this morning bring us word of your unfailing love, your loving kindness, your steadfast love. Well, by way of introduction, um, the early church called these, this is the last of seven penitential psalms. And David's in trouble. It's uh, another cry to God from a time of crisis and affliction because of David's many enemies. Now, I love this story, which we're going to look at next. A police cadet was set this question in an exam. You are on the beat, and you see two dogs fighting. The dogs knock a baby out of its pram, causing a car to swerve off the road, smashing into a grocer's shop. You notice the driver is your chief superintendent and that his passenger is not his wife. A pedestrian is seriously injured, but during the confusion, a woman's handbag is snatched. A crowd of onlookers chase after the thief and the huge buildup of traffic, the ambulance is blocked from the victim, uh, victim's crash. Bearing in mind the Public Order Act of 1975 and the Traffic Act of 1989, state in order of priority your course of action. The cadet sucked his pen, scratched his head, and then wrote, take off uniform and mingle with the crowd. <laughs> Lord, hear our prayer, which is our next one up, please. Um, Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me. In your righteousness, enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. So the opening of this psalm used to be a favorite Taze chant. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that in, in Australia. O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, hear my prayer. Come and listen to me. 70s and 80s, they were very popular, these Taze chants. Now, because of the way of listening or hearing was inextricably entwined with acting and carrying out, the logic of this cry is, if you listen, God, then you're sure to act. How audacious is prayer? How dare we expect God Almighty to listen to us? But the audacity is also very humble. The cry is, for mercy. The story of David is, is conflicted, but it's also a very exciting story. It really is an action thriller. Uh, David is pursued relentlessly by Saul, um, and there's this impossible situation where there are two uh, anointed kings, um, but one has been rejected by God. And Saul sees only one solution, and that's David's death. Now, uh, I've, I've known many uh, very exciting times in my life, and uh, one of these uh, was when we were living in Nigeria just before Christmas when a riot broke out on the building site that I was working, supervising some works on the University of Benin, and 400 laborers were rioting, and they seemed to be in a murderous rage. And uh, their cause was an imagined withholding of their Christmas wages and Christmas bonus. I used to conduct little gospel um, Bible studies with uh, some of the laborers. About 30 of them used to turn up. And the Christians amongst them, in the middle of this riot, they somehow shoehorned me into my car and formed a human shield over front and, and sides and back of the car and beckoned me out, beckoned me out, and somehow, I don't know how, the, the people at the gate let me go, and I was able to rush off and get the police, and it turned out that no bonus was withheld, and the whole thing was a storm in a teacup, but at the time, it seemed very dangerous indeed. Prayer is audacious. Prayer was very quickly answered in that crisis. Uh, it's also based entirely on God's faithfulness. It's, it's all to do with the reliability of the one to whom we pray. In your faithfulness, answer me. In your righteousness, says David. God is 100% righteous. He can never let us down or make a wrong move. He's 100% reliable. 100% reliable, 100% righteous. He does what is right in line with his holy will. Yes, the Lord is 100% righteous, but we certainly are not. 
Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. And as if by a little miracle, I've suddenly seen that the clicker is found, and here it is on my desk. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it works. Unlike David, we know one who is righteous before God. We know him. We know Jesus. Rejoice greatly, uh, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. What's he like? Righteous. Say it with me. Righteous. And having salvation is he. And in Acts 22:14. Uh, Paul's defense from a, a murderous mob, he says, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the, say it with me, righteous one and hear him speak. He's talking about Jesus, of course, whose righteousness was shown in many ways, not least in his obedience, total obedience to the Father. John's gospel is packed with incidents of Jesus' obedience. Jesus said to them, my food, sorry, not that one, let's go back. Will it go back? My goodness me, I have gone completely off. Right. Is that um, John 4? No. There we are, thank you. Might be a miracle, but it doesn't always work in my hands. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. He also said, for I've come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me and not to do my own will. And Jesus famously challenged his enemies by saying to them on one occasion, which of you convicts me of sin? What an opportunity. Wow, if only they could have come up with something, but they couldn't find a single thing. In fact, Jesus is declared not guilty by Pilate in Luke 23, and his righteousness was recognized by the, by the centurion who was supervising his crucifixion. So, there's the bar set by Jesus, who comes up to the standard, no one, says David, not one. No one, says the rest of scripture, Romans 3.23. Um, no, no one comes up to the standard. No one comes up to the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So all of us are in the same boat. What wonderful good news we have, which is not accessible at this point of history to David. Here it is. For everyone has sinned, we fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Jesus Christ, when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. So here is good news. Uh, as we are looking at the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus, through the lens of the New Testament, we see that we are extravagantly blessed because we are counted as righteous, free of judgment. Many of you may be familiar with the acrostic uh, joy standing for Jesus, others, and yourself. In a Christmas message, a pastor called Phil Toole said it should look like this. Jesus, O oh, yourself. Jesus, obviously, the J obviously stands for Jesus and the Y for yourself. What does the O stand for? The O stands for nothing. Nothing should stand between us and Jesus. And then we will be filled with joy. So, here we go. Are we on the right thing? Yes, heavy with distress. Verse 3 to 4 of our psalm. For the enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He's made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Therefore my spirit faints within me. My heart within me is appalled. Saul hounded David. Um, looking at this picture, Tom said yesterday that he was obviously not a very good shot because he missed. But Saul hounded David with... He had this paranoid fear for his crown, and he had this psychopathic intent to kill David. Now, perhaps this psalm was during one of those close brushes with death. Um, maybe he's reflecting on the treachery of the very people he'd rescued. 
It could even be uh, the result of his disastrous lack of parenting wisdom that left him desolate at the death of his son Absalom. Kidner comments, every phrase here, phrase here is so heavy with distress that no sufferer need feel unique in what they experience. Even more poignant than David's troubles here are the feelings Jesus must have felt as he faced taking on the vile pus of the world's sin, of our sin. The relentless pursuit of Satan through his life. Crushing sorrow of separation from Father God as he hung on the cross. The darkness of the Gethsemane night. His spirit grows faint, his heart is appalled. Whatever you're going through, we need never feel alone or if the Lord does not understand. I remember, says David, the days of old. I meditate on all that you've done. I ponder the works of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. Here is a shift of focus. The focus is starting to turn from the inner pain to looking up to start praising God. There's a double memory here. Memory one, the memory of all God's amazing, mighty works. And David is a shepherd living in the hills uh, 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 of, of Palestine. Um, the night sky must have been just like it is in the desert here. And the second memory is counting his blessings from life before this event. See, he's not bereft of knowing God's blessing in his life. Memories, yes, perhaps of tending the flock under the wonder of a starry night, but memories of defeating Goliath or memories of his friendship with Jonathan. There are times when it's good for us to remember the days of old. We can remember the sweet and good times of our early life with God, and it blesses us. We can also remember the days of old before our own time, thinking of the great things God has done among his people, both in the Bible and in stories that we know from our own experience. Even if remembering the days of old fills us with a measure of sadness to think how distant those better days may seem, we can use those memories to restore our hope. This is what Spurgeon says. When we see nothing new which can cheer us, let us think upon old things. We once had merry days, days of deliverance and joy and thanksgiving. Why not again? This is the great God to whom David addresses his prayers. I stretch out my hands to you. This is the traditional uh, Jewish way of praying. I know we are even more um, uh, radical than that. We don't do anything with our hands, but the old way was indeed to lift your hands in praise. So uh, that's how it used to be in David's day. My soul longs for you like a parched land. I thirst for you like a parched land. And in, in the NIV, I think it is, it says, my soul longs for you. So there's a longing in David's heart, a longing in the very essence of his being. He's thirsty for God's presence. Now, sometimes we're blessed with a feeling of God's presence, his nearness, his mercy warming our hearts, and at other times, all such feelings are gone. Our prayers seem to bounce off the ceiling, our worries come flooding back, and we feel we're drying up inside. Hurry with your answer, God. I'm nearly at the end of my rope. Uh, that's the message translation. The ESV is a little more restrained. Answer me quickly, Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I'll be like those who go down to the pit. To lose his connection to God is to live in spiritual death, the pit. Jesus never lost that open communication channel with the Father. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. On another occasion, he says, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. And David's thirst for God's presence should challenge us all. It should shake us out of a, a low expectation in hearing from the Lord. Sort of jogging along in the same old boring route, rut. Now, 
to the verse that thrills me and is why I chose this psalm. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I've put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord, for I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. What a beautiful prayer. A beautiful morning prayer. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. Why? Because David's ultimate trust is in God. Now, the word used for love is a, a, a very famous uh, Bible word. It's the Hebrew word. It's, it's fathomless, really, unfailing love. It, it's the word chesed. I don't write or understand or know Hebrew, but I trust that the scholars are right. I'm looking at Tom. That is the Hebrew for chesed, and he's nodding encouragingly at me. <laughs> Steadfast love. Loving kindness is sometimes is the way it's put in the Bible. It's one of the richest words in the Bible. Often its context tells us of God's steadfast, loyal love for his covenant people, Israel. It had a powerful meaning for God's people freed from slavery in Egypt. And in the middle of a great praise psalm in uh, Exodus 15, God's um, unfa uh, unfailing love is there for his people. God promised this love to many generations of Israelites, including David. Brings that up in Psalm 89. More than half of the Bible references uh, to this covenant love are found in the Psalms, and about half of those are in the Psalms of David. Spurgeon said chesed, or loving kindness, is one of the sweetest words in our language. Doubly dear, it is the cream of kindness. In fact, David ask for the morning to bring word of God's unfailing love. So, that shows us that he's beginning to look forward, that the night is not endless. He's beginning to remind himself of this incredible love. So he's beginning to start to hope. Faith is starting to take shape in him. Spurgeon again, this is on faith. Look at the faith of the master mariner. He loses his cable. He streams away from the land. For days, weeks, even months, he sees neither sail nor shore. Yet on he goes, day and night, without fear, till one morning he finds himself exactly opposite the desired haven toward which he was steering. Now, how has he found his way over the trackless deep? He's trusted his compass, his nautical almanac, his glasses, and the heavenly bodies, and obeying their guidance, without sighting land, he steered to, so, so accurately that he's not changed a point to enter port. It is a wonderful thing. It is glorious to be so far out in the ocean of divine love, believing in God, and steering for heaven straight away by the direction of the word of God. Amen? Good to hear you're still with me. guidance. Three times in verses 8 to 10, David prays for guidance. Show me the way. Teach me to do your will. Lead me on the level ground. And embedded in his need to know God's way is the petition, the request, the, 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 the deep need. Here comes the ask right in the middle of this psalm. Rescue me. Rescue me from my enemies. If Psalm 142 was written when David was hiding in the cave, then this one that follows straight afterwards, he asked God to hide him in God himself. Not in a cave, to be hidden in God for refuge provided by God. Paul exhorts us to set our hearts on things above, for we've died when Christ died, and our life is now hidden with Christ in God. This is where true security lies. Not in material wealth, not in what others think of us, not in success, not in status either in church or the world, or as we're discovering because we're downsizing so drastically, not in stuff. Our true security is in Christ, hidden with him in the higher realms where Christ reigns. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. 
Here is the safest place to be, in the center of God's will. Here is also the best way to know God's will, to be taught by him. Here are two of the um, five main planks of guidance taught on the Alpha course. One commanding spirit and two, sorry, one commanding scripture and two compelling spirit. Most of what we need to know to navigate this life is already here. It's already in the scriptures. Love God. Love those around you that he's put you amongst. Love your family. Love and care for them. Don't wreck your marriage with adultery. All that is already there. You don't need to pray for guidance for that. It's already set out. Then the Holy Spirit, David asks, may your good spirit lead me. So commanding scripture, compelling spirit. And the first place to ask the spirit to guide us and, and give us some sense of reality in this is to set our hearts on fire when we are reading his word. Don't you think that's a good place to start? Next, we need to be sensitive to his prompting. Now with me, it's a thought to reach out to someone pastorally, you know, make that telephone call. Or perhaps in conversation with someone to say, mm -mm, no, it's not a good thing to share. Withhold that. These promptings need testing. Is it loving? Is it strengthening and encouraging and comforting? If you're at the end of critical advice, especially dressed up in spiritual language, then you may remember this test is not being followed. It's not loving. It's not strengthening. It's not encouraging. It's not in fact, it's depressing. Does it bring the peace of God? Colossians 3. Let the peace of Christ rule in your, in, our, in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Do we know God's peace in the action we're about to take? Another way the Spirit leads us onto a level ground is a strong impression in our minds that will not go away. That was uh, my experience when, uh, during the period of, of swapping over from being an architect to being a minister. It was just almost as though the Holy Spirit was nagging me. No, he doesn't do that, but that was the, the feeling. Again, a word of caution, test it. Is this desired action in line with the Bible? Have we tried talking it out with wise saints we trust? Meanwhile, life is at risk. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life, for in your righteousness bring my soul out of trouble, and in your steadfast love, there it is again, in your steadfast love uh, you will cut off my enemies and you will destroy all the adversaries of my soul, for I am your servant. So David's focus has shifted um, out of his depression, out of the pit, onto God, his refuge, and he's looking to God's firm commitment to, to, to love him with kindness. And the force of his appeal is, not for, is for the sake of God's name. Yahweh's reputation is bound up with his holy name. He's promised to care for his people, including David, his anointed king. And God's glory is part of this. Now, we might be a bit squeamish about how God can cut off David's enemy in his love. How does that work? How does God cut off his enemies in his love? Well, we might be even more troubled at his request that the adversaries of his soul should be destroyed. And before we start jumping up and down, note this, that David has asked God to deal with him first and then his enemies. He knew that his own low or uninspired or undirected walk with God was a greater danger than any enemy. And secondly, ultimately, the destruction of those who oppose God's anointing king will choose death. They will choose this rather than surrendering to the king of kings, King Jesus. So how do we apply this? Well, I see this really as a prayer template as we approach Jesus and Father in prayer, first seek an audience with the Lord in the secret place, in your secret chamber, and ask him to hear your prayer. Don't be afraid to ask for mercy and to appeal to God's faithfulness. Next, humble ourselves under his mighty hand. He knows best. He's in control. And we are so outrageously blessed to be counted righteous from Jesus' blood. We need to be honest with God and tell him how it seems from our earthbound perspective, even if this is from within 
crushing depression. Remind ourselves of God's mighty works, both in creation and from our experience. There's no need to be polite. Answer me quickly, Lord. Then pray the best prayer request of all. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. Seek guidance from within this prayer and soak in the scripture and ask God to write his word in our, on our hearts. And don't be ashamed to ask for rescue from your trouble. Shall we bow our heads and pray together? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you've given us this glorious prayer book and hymn book and book of poetry to guide our prayers, to bring us in close contact with you, to open our hearts for you to pour the waterfall of your unfailing love over us. Let the morning bring us all word of your unfailing love because we put our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now that we've spent some time being reminded of the goodness of God, of all that he is and all that he has done, would you all please stand and join with me as we declare together what it is that we believe about our God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Can I get you all to stay standing as we sing together?
please take a seat. Return to the Lord your God, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Let us now confess our sins to Almighty God together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Here's the awesome news, guys. God desires that none should perish, but that all should turn to Christ and live. God pardons all those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. Therefore, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. I'm going to invite Chris up, and she's going to lead us in a time of prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Listen to our cries for mercy. Loving Father, as we stand at the beginning of the new year, we confess our need for your presence and guidance throughout 2022. We each have our hopes and expectations for this year, but you alone knows what it holds for us, and only you can give us the strength and the wisdom we will need to meet the challenges we may face. So help us to humbly put our lives into your hands and to trust you in all things. We praise you, Father, that your word assures us that in the midst of life's uncertainties, we can rest in the certainty of your unfailing love for us. So when disappointments come, please help us to turn to you for the stability and comfort we will need. When we are tempted to follow other paths, help us to have the courage to do what is right, regardless of the personal cost. And in the midst of our daily work and leisure, please open our eyes to those around us who are hurting and help us to respond to them with love and compassion. May our constant prayer be like that of King David, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, as we pray for our world, we thank you that all things are under your control. You have not abandoned us. You are reigning over all the earth. So, Father God, we ask that you would stop the spread of the coronavirus. We pray that COVID, with all its variances, variants, would recede and diminish, and that the numbers of those infected would decline quickly. We do pray for those who are sick, that they will have access to the care and treatment they need, especially those in third world countries. We uphold before you all health workers and carers and other essential personnel, and we pray for their protection from COVID. We pray too for those struggling with isolation or the frustration of waiting hours for PCR testing. Father, in the ever-changing landscape that COVID brings, we pray you will give wisdom to our federal and state leaders as they often have to make quick decisions that affect so many. Father, we pray too for those who have spent so much time organising events like summer school, only to find that they can't go ahead. But we do thank you, Father, for the technology that enables some of these events to be moved online. But above all, we pray, Lord, 
that this pandemic will cause people to think in the light of eternity. May they stretch out their hands to you. May they thirst for you like a parched land and come to you in repentance and faith. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray, Father, for our church. We pray for refreshment for our rector, Peter, and our community chaplain, Michelle. May they have your wisdom and strength as they face all the joys and challenges of the ministry to which you have called them. We pray also for your clear guidance for our wardens, Earl, Cheryl and Peter, and all our parish councillors. We give thanks for all the work they do and all the time that they put into helping make decisions about important matters that affect our parish. We pray especially for our treasurer, Lynn, as she seeks to balance this year's budget. And we pray that the sale of the parish house will go ahead smoothly. We pray too, Father, for this community where you have placed us. We ask that this year you will give us renewed zeal to connect people to God through Jesus Christ. We pray that we will explore creative ways to reach out with the gospel message so many may belong, believe and become. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, as we pray for those in need, we thank you that we've seen some amazing answers to prayer throughout the past year. And we thank you for all those who have prayed so faithfully. Yet we are also conscious that there are those who have experienced suffering, loss and difficult circumstances. We cannot always fathom why you allow these things to happen but we do know that you are our sovereign Lord and that your goodness and mercy and love never fail. So today we bring before you Alvara, Janie, Tim, Rhys, Miriam, Ros and John, Alan and Yvonne, Elizabeth, Les and Emma, Faye, Wayne, Lynn and Jeff, and we pray for your healing and protection for the Gupta family. And we ask especially, Lord, for your comfort for Glenda and Justina as they mourn the loss of their mothers. We ask particularly that your arms of love may be around Justina as she cannot travel to the UK for her mum's funeral. Lord, you are our faithful God. So we commit ourselves afresh to you as we go into this year. Lord, for ourselves, in living power, remake us, self on the cross and Christ upon the throne, past put behind us, for the future take us, Lord of our lives, to live for Christ alone. Let's join in saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. All right. Well, we're about to have the list of things that I need to tell you about come up on the screen, but I'm pretty sure it's a small list today, so... Happy birthday, Shirley. Is she here? All right, everyone will go to her house. Huh? <laughs> if you get a chance, give her a call or send her a text message and wish her a happy birthday. Just the one birthday this week? Okay. 
We are halfway through our combined January services, so you know, please don't come at 10 or 8 or 5.30 for the next couple of weeks because you'll be lonely. Is there anything else to mention about them? And there's no more slides. Oh, my. Oh, of course, because Peter and Michelle are not here. There's no uh, Wednesday night, no Wednesday morning things or anything, is there? Okay. That was very simple. And now I know where I am. Let's stand and sing our last song. loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, feeding us with your word, and encouraging us in our meeting together. Take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the God of peace equip us with everything good for doing his will, working in us what is pleasing to him through whom, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, we're done with the official portion of the morning, but you're welcome to hang around and chat, um, or disappear if that's what you'd rather do. Up to you.